Hey everybody, Rob here. It's time for a brand new Pro Revenge Story. My boss was abusive and didn't care about staff, so I cost him his store and his contracts. Let's jump right in. Did you know over 70% of people that watch my videos aren't actually subscribed to the channel? Please hit that subscribe button for more daily Reddit stories. Backstory. I was an idiot growing up and ended up in a rehabilitation program for people under 18 to avoid jail time and eventually got given a place at a large charity agency that sources workers for anything from retail to gardening. The person directly in control of my position at said charity was one of those I'm too nice for anyone to notice me doing wrong people and he put me, someone who literally couldn't and still can't years later talk to a stranger without panicking, into a job in retail speaking to upwards of 35 plus customers a day. May not sound like a lot, but I struggled to make it through a day without going into the back room and crying. Story. So I get assigned to work in a, unsure of the right word here, but privately owned retail place that sells upcycled furniture. I had previously worked at the site actually doing the upcycling and knew this stuff was a scam. Barely had a thing changed and the people doing the work spent most of the day drinking coffee and smoking while playing games on their phones. The boss of this site, Kevin, showed just what kind of person he was from day one by threatening to fire me for telling him I can't handle strangers and shouting in my face. God, I wish he had fired me. This never got better, and over the months of working there, and I eventually started recording it all without his knowledge. Among the things he did is this list. 1. Shouting at staff for not putting toilet paper on the holder. There was a pile of it on the back of the toilet. 2. Calling the person in charge of my placement and reporting me for lack of workplace enthusiasm in front of me while I was having a panic attack. 3 telling a 70 plus year old woman who I worked with that she needs to grow up and handle confrontation like a man after having two large men shout and swear at her for refusing to sell an already sold item to them. 4. Throwing his phone, told by another employee, after I called in sick for a day due to crippling stomach pains brought on by Crohn's. 5. After being told at 11 a.m that I won't make it to my shift due to being in the hospital, proceeded to call me at 3 a.m. the next morning and yell at me. He seemed very drunk, demanding I have a doctor prove I was in the hospital because I didn't give two weeks notice. And back to the story. All of this was recorded in the space of only three weeks, and I gave it all to my placement manager, who proceeded to organize a meeting between himself Kevin and me to try and put things right. During this meeting, however, instead of calmly talking about the issue and what can be done to solve it, all the evidence was shown to Kevin, who then yelled at me for recording him, then throwing a full-on tantrum that I would dare question his style of management while I sat there scared as hell and my placement manager just did nothing. Back we go to work with a final warning strike issued to me for gross misconduct and told that I should do as stated in my contract and anything else that is asked of me or I would be fired. I do everything I can to follow my contract and anything else asked of me including cleaning a toilet and see a broken window above it. That's when I finally get a plan together. The Revenge. The plan I came up with meant I had to stay in everyone's good books, deal with a-hole customers, go to work even in crippling pain, and dose up on meds to control my panicking, but in exchange, my belief was I could get Kevin replaced or at least get myself removed from the situation. I should have clarified earlier, being fired from any site also gets you taken off the charity's payroll. I started informing Kevin of every little safety violation the site managed to break, from broken windows in the female toilets, loose light fixtures, and broken locks on doors, all the way up to a giant glass panel going across the front of the shop that was barely hanging in by a few bits of rubber and could easily kill a small child or less than strong adult if it were to fall out. I emailed him and texted him about each one individually and brought it up to other staff 
in hopes they would do the same, while also making sure to take photos of each of these issues so I could use them again later. Another month and a half of working there, and at this point, I felt I may have a little too many minor details saved up, but decided it's best to go overkill than underkill, and sent a huge email to the UK HSE, Health and Safety Executive, detailing every risk and danger with photos attached to show what the place was doing wrong and requesting an inspection. Of course they obliged. One week later, I get a phone call from Kevin. He tells me how the shop is closing down, how a safety inspection was carried out, and how it had been failed so badly that he lost his contract with the charity, and that nobody would be able to use the building for weeks while everything gets brought back up to code. But he couldn't run the place anymore due to money issues while it was closed because he had no savings for this. I never heard from him again. A year later, after this happened, I moved on and began working from home doing image editing for quick cash, and around a year later, I get a call from the placement manager, who hadn't heard from me the whole time, and I got asked in the coldest, most passive-aggressive tone, why didn't you tell me the store closed? Turns out, they had been apparently paying me £300 a day for a job I didn't have, hours I didn't work, and this was all apparently being reported on the charity's income as someone else's account. They got me confused with another person and reporting their hard work on my files, and it took them a year to notice because of how badly they handled everything. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me the store closed? Well, because one, you didn't ask, and two, I wasn't paid to do your job. I do find it a little hard to believe though that they continued paying him for a year and nobody noticed that this place had been shut down. That just doesn't sit right with me. What about you guys? I'd love to see your comments down below. On to our next story. Fired? Are you sure? Okay. Let's jump right in. So my friend's father, since retired, was a mechanical engineer. He was around 55 when this happened and very experienced in his field. In fact, he had some skill sets that were close to unique to the extent that you might be able to replicate them, but at extreme cost. We're talking multiple people from multiple companies from multiple countries taking weeks, if not months, to get up to speed with specific projects to do the same things. He was also a no BS kind of guy who did his job, did it well, but also pointed out problems and expected others to point out problems to him. He was extremely solution-oriented and had no time for office politics or keeping a positive attitude at work. Basically, your everyday grumpy older engineer who really knew his thing and always ready to help if you asked, but not very forthcoming in team building exercises and so on. He also ran his business on the side, doing minor projects and so on. As was required by his employer, he had reported this and was sure to not cause any conflicts of interest, so his employer knew and accepted this. He was considered a valuable employee and got several awards that he cared little for, but anyway, during his many years with this employer, by all accounts they paid him well, respected his knowledge, and accommodated his style, and he returned the favor by working very hard and making sure to mentor younger and newly employed engineers to make them effective co-workers. When his firm was acquired by a larger firm and a new management team installed, initially everyone was promised that things would remain the same, but with the new management came a new office culture. The new management pressured for unpaid overtime, for a more American corporate culture, with cheering and clapping and so on. He considered it extremely cringe and refused to participate. His status as a long-standing and knowledgeable employee kept him safe for some time before the new management realized that resistance to the new culture centered around him and started pressuring him to play along. When he did not, they turned increasingly hostile, realizing that he held a lot of soft power in the company, having mentored a large percentage of the engineers and resistance to their leadership centering around him. They started ordering him to work overtime. 
he answered that he was on time with his projects and that if they had identified an emergency requiring overtime, they would have to bring it up with the union to negotiate the overtime and make sure it was an actual emergency. The contract with the union said no overtime unless in an emergency. They tried to force him to participate in the cheering and clapping by making it mandatory for him to attend and yelling at him to participate, and he did, but so unenthusiastically that the event turned even more cringe and people started laughing. The workday turned more and more hostile, and he knew that things would come to head sooner or later. Being an experienced engineer and knowing how to document things, he already had his ducks in a row. Then, it finally happened. They caught him answering an email for his side business on his work laptop, brought him in, and fired him on the spot for theft of company resources. He sat at the conference table and looked the three managers in their eyes, one after the other, and asked, Are you sure you want to do this? They all said yes. Are you really sure you want to do this? He was escorted to his desk by security to leave his phone, his badge, and his computer at the desk, and then escorted out. Once out of the building, he phoned his union representative, who immediately cancelled the firing, claiming there was no just cause, which meant that it would go to the labor board for arbitration. You see, the company had an IT policy that it was okay to use the company laptop for personal business, including a side business, as long as you were on a break and compliant with IT security protocols. And the company was aware of and had approved his side business, and he was on a break. Of course, he had his declaration of a side business signed by his former manager and the IT policy available and sent both to the union representative. He then called his lawyer and asked him to send the pre-prepared cease and desist on two patents he held, patents that were not that significant and nothing he could make any serious money out of since they were mostly for very specific things used by the solutions he designed and used at his employers but still his that he had brought with him into the employment and allowed the employer to use in exchange for a slightly higher pay, all duly documented in his contract, of course. Then, he went home for some vacation and tending his side business. He was always a man to prepare and had enough money saved up to last him for a good time, to the extent that he considered retiring entirely. My friend said he had two job offers from competitors that had looked to sniping him for some time within the week, basically as soon as they learned he was available. He was gracious but declined, but offered them to consult with his side business now that he had the time, which they eagerly accepted at twice the hourly rate he had made at his earlier employers. His colleagues started ringing the day after for advice since the projects he had managed could not go on without him, he was perfectly polite, but denied any information and help, saying he had left everything he had with management and to contact them, as he was no longer employed there. Several clients that phoned his private number were told the same thing. Since his private number was not on a public registry, he suspected that both colleagues and clients spent some time and or money to find it. It took two weeks before a manager phoned him and asked things. He politely declined to answer, got yelled at, and replied with something like, I'm sorry, you must have mistaken me for someone who works for you, and hung up. This happens a few times, and the next week HR phoned him and stated the firing had been a mistake and he was welcome back to his job. He again politely declined, saying that he awaited the labor board's decision, but until then, he was happy to consult for them at six times his hourly pay, after taxes and administrative costs, of course. After a few days of wrangling and trying to negotiate, they had to accept. And then he sprung the patent issue on them, forcing them to pay for those two. Less than two and a half weeks after being fired, he was back at his desk. After roughly three months, the firing came to the labor board. The employer stated that they believed they had handled the issue correctly, but were still willing to offer my friend's father his position back in the interest of goodwill and reconciliation. 
My friend's father and the union simply stated that he was now employed elsewhere, his own company, and no longer available. The labor board ruled in my friend's father's and the union's favor, and he got the normal damages, three months pay damage, and 24 months pay severance package, including pension, and of course, the lawyer costs of the union paid by the employer. According to my friend, her father continued to work there until he retired, working 20 hours or so per week and 10 to 15 hours for other companies, making a pretty penny, continuing to charge them three times what he charged their competitors as an a-hole tax. The managers were not fired, but they were moved into their own group apart from the rest of the department when it came to bonus calculations and the costs of her father's consultancy fees, and the costs of the labor board arbitration were budgeted there, meaning they were constantly over budget, and thus ineligible for bonuses for several years, which was a decent percentage of the incentives at that company, making at least one of them quit. My friend also said her father usually met any management complaints with a big shit-eating grin, and what are you gonna do, fire me? after that. I think the biggest part of this story that resonated with me was the fake enthusiasm and clapping in these general meetings. I worked for a company where you had to be on one of these meeting phone calls once a week, every single week, and it was just a big circle jerk for the owner of the company, everybody thanking him for everything amazing that he'd done. Well, it was just a bunch of bullshit. I think this actually brings the morale down instead of bringing it up, and I can see why OP's friend's dad was very sarcastic in his compliance. I'd like to thank both OPs for posting their stories to the Pro Revenge subreddit. You can visit them at the links in the description below. Please go there and give them an upvote. Once again, this is Rob from Karma Comment Chameleon saying thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that subscribe button, drop a like, and share it with your friends. And we'll see you in the next one.